This video contains traces of severe stupidity and scenes of graphic ownage. Viewer discretion is advised. Somewhere in the vastness of the universe lies the Virgo supercluster, a very average galactic supercluster, deep inside which is a very ordinary galaxy we call the Milky Way. In a small spur of this galaxy known as the Orion Arm sits a completely standard star we call Sol. And around this star, among a myriad of planets, comets, asteroids and other objects, orbits a truly remarkable world. The Earth and the Sun have danced for eons, during which time they have birthed and nurtured life in all its diversity. You and I may feel small in the universe, but we are deeply significant. To quote the great Carl Sagan, we are made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. This is what the evidence tells us. But there are some people out there who think they know better than evidence. Textbooks say, well, yes, there are magnetic reversals at the bottom of this mid-Atlantic ridge. Well, that's simply baloney, okay? There are no reversed polarity areas, unless it's where rocks flipped over when the fountains of the deep broke open. That may have happened in some areas. But this, this is a lie, talking about magnetic reversals. I don't know where you think dishonesty is going to get you when you die, Kent, and I don't much care. What does interest me, though, is that you're willing to claim no pole reversal has ever taken place, when they are clearly documented, not just at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but many oceanic ridges and lava flows worldwide. Geomagnetic reversals do not result in rocks being toppled over either, but rather a change in the orientation of magnetic minerals within rocks that are forming. So, when molten rock reaches the top of the crust and cools, these minerals adopt one orientation. When the pole reverses, subsequent new rock contains minerals which are oppositely orientated. By corroborating evidence from all over the globe, scientists have identified that pole reversals have been happening for quite a long time, at an average interval of around a quarter of a million years. Evidently, life on Earth is capable of enduring these events. No, there are no magnetic reversals, only stronger and weaker magnetism. Once again, lies. It's the orientation that gives us a clue about the changing direction. See, the Earth has lost 10% of its magnetic strength in the last 150 years. It's lost 40% of its strength in the last 1,000 years. It's pretty overwhelming evidence that the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. What does that mean? Well, that means it used to be stronger. And if the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker, this creates a problem, because if you go back in time, about 25,000 years, the magnetic strength would have been too great for life to exist here. Guess what? It was one degree warmer outside yesterday. Pretty overwhelming evidence that the Earth's temperature is dropping. What does that mean? Well, it means it used to be higher. In fact, applying Hovind's logic, we can infer that it was at least 365 degrees hotter one year ago. Or we could just take a look at reality. See, this particular nugget of creationist crap has been floating around for over 20 years, during which time the flies from ICR and CSE have been all over it. Thomas Barnes, a creation physicist, first proposed the magnetic field decay hypothesis, which he triumphed as proof that life on Earth could not have survived more than 10,000 years ago. Unfortunately, he failed to provide any evidence for his idea. Furthermore, his speculation that the field strength is and always has been declining exponentially is totally meaningless, because we can and have actually measured the historical field strength and proved that it fluctuates. See, magnetite deposits retain information about both the orientation and strength. Useful, eh? It should also be noted that Barnes only considered the dipole component of the field when attempting to predict patterns in its decay. Whilst the dipole component has declined recently, non-dipole components, which Barnes all too conveniently dismissed as noise, have acted to make up the shortfall, such that the total field strength has actually stayed almost exactly the same. Barnes is dead now, but there are plenty of goons out there still peddling his crap. Some of them may try to overwhelm you with very technical arguments, but all you need to tell them is that Barnes's assumptions were entirely wrong, and his work never appeared in a peer-reviewed publication. It's the propagation of lies like this that have won Ken Hovind my vote in the 2008 coveted Golden Crocodile Awards hosted by Pothole of 54. But if I had to nominate a runner-up, you guys would probably guess who it was, right? We also have been blessed with a tremendous, a tremendous amount of water. Uh, about 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Water is, of course, necessary for life. It's also unusual, at least from an evolutionary perspective, because none of it should be there. <laughs> That's a bold claim, but let's be scientific about this. I mean, obviously water should be here because it is. The question is, how did it come to be this way? As we saw in the last video, theory suggests Venus once had oceans of liquid water, and as we'll see in the next video, the evidence that Mars was once wet is overwhelming. According to our understanding, liquid water on Mercury's surface is a scientific impossibility, even though its exosphere actually contains very large quantities of water vapour. But if the other three terrestrial planets had water, then it's not too surprising that Earth still has it today, given the conditions of its orbit and atmosphere. 
Water is abundant throughout the solar system, and indeed the galaxy, and why not? After all, hydrogen and oxygen are respectively the first and third most common elements in the universe. Scientists suggest that newly forming stars provide the required energy to nebulae around them for water to form, and this is consistent with observations of stellar nurseries in the Orion Nebula. So where did it come from? Well, we didn't used to have it, but after everything was formed, comets and other materials that had water came in and hit us. Does anyone else not get that joke? I mean, it's a pretty weak effort at discrediting what is actually a very good hypothesis, although not strictly with comets. See, evidence actually suggests that water-rich asteroids were the likely candidate for delivering large quantities of water to the inner solar system. And there are plenty of other mechanisms for topping up Earth's oceans over time, such as water being a byproduct of reactions in early prokaryotic bacteria, and the release of vapor from the planet's interior. Now, the moon is much smaller than the sun. Uh, it's only one four hundredth the size of our sun. However, by an amazing coincidence, the sun is 400 times further away from us than the moon is. Yes, it is an amazing coincidence. He's not seriously going to use this one, is he? As a result, the apparent size of the moon and the sun are exactly the same as viewed from the Earth. Well, it's extremely rare that an eclipse will occur when the moon and the sun are exactly the same apparent size. See, both the Earth and the moon are in elliptical orbits, and the apparent size of the sun and the moon oscillate as a result of this. In general, as we go into the future, the moon will apparently shrink as it recedes from the Earth, and the sun will actually grow, literally. Now, there was an article written a while back trying to calculate the chances of this happening just by random coincidence, and, you know, it's ridiculous. Hmm. Uncited articles aren't particularly convincing to me. In any case, it's a completely erroneous calculation, as there are simply far too many variables involved. You know, the best way to assess the probability of getting solar eclipses, at least locally, would be to look at other planets and moons in the solar system. Um, no, nothing else in the solar system even comes close to the system we have with the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, the way it's all positioned. Really? Nothing else in the solar system? Spike, the probability of getting solar eclipses like we do on Earth may be quite low, but welcome to a universe of large numbers. In 1610, Galileo Galilei first discovered what we now call the Galilean moons, Io, Ganymede, Europa, and Callisto. All four of these giant satellites produce total solar eclipses on Jupiter, as does the much smaller but also much closer Amalthea. Eclipses on Jupiter are pretty frequent too. And then there's Pluto and its companions Charon, Nix and Hydra, all of which cast it entirely in shadow during eclipse periods. So ignoring satellites of asteroids and TNOs, roughly 5% of moons in the solar system produce total solar eclipses. Nothing else in the solar system even comes close to the system we have with the Earth, the Moon and the Sun. Yeah, I think someone failed to do their homework. In light of recent events here on YouTube, and just for a change of scenery, I thought I'd briefly visit some classic creationism from the artist formerly known as Venom Fang X. What science can we do to prove the Bible is correct and that the Earth is not 4.5 billion years old? Hmm, um... Oh, I know. Bad science. Okay, let's get right into this. The sun uses 5 million tons of hydrogen every single second, so... There goes five million, there goes five million, there goes five million, it just keeps going. Okay, so, if the sun has been consuming five million tons of hydrogen for the lifespan that the scientists claim the age of the sun is, which is about six billion years according to them, then the sun would have been large enough to swallow the earth only a few million years ago if indeed it had that much hydrogen. Absolutely impossible for it to be billions of years old, and thus the earth cannot be billions of years old. Well, yeah, I mean, how could the Earth be here if the Sun wasn't? Oh, wait, in Genesis, the Earth is like two days older than the Sun. Well, anyway, PCS's idea is based on scientific principles which predate the 1930s, and surprise, surprise, ignores everything afterwards. Before the discovery of nuclear fusion, the process now known to drive stars, the best explanation for the energy released from the Sun was that it was undergoing gravitational collapse, often referred to as the Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction. This process is key to the initial life of the star, but in order to burn for billions of years, a much more efficient process is needed. Still, the sun does shed huge amounts of mass per second, right? Well, it sounds like a huge amount, but in relative terms, it really isn't. In fact, over the predicted 10 billion year lifetime of the sun, it will lose less than one thousandth of its initial main sequence mass. The sun likely had much more mass before it entered the main sequence, which was lost during the t tauri wind phase of its birth. Does the sun change size? Yes, it oscillates moderately, but it's not significant. Just like with the declining magnetic field, it's foolish to extrapolate the current trend backwards to the beginning of time. Well, I'll leave you with a little gem of creationist doltishness that almost deserves its own award for YouTube's fastest rate of falsehoods. Until next time, this is Andromeda's Wake, wishing you clear skies and good debunking. The oldest tree in the earth is 4,400 years old. The oldest desert in this world is 4,400 years old. The oldest coral reef on this planet is 4,400 years old.